My name is Shannon Patterson. I'm a third year psychology major from Arroyo Grande, California, and the vice president of the Theodore Roosevelt Executive Committee. It is my pleasure today to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kimberly Porter. Dr. Porter grew up on a farm in Iowa and obtained her PhD from the University of Iowa in 1995. She joined the University of North Dakota in 1996 and has been a history pr professor there for 18 years, focusing her coursework on United States history and the history of North Dakota. Dr. Porter was the first recipient of the Bard and Nikki Bockel History Fellowship, a, fe a fellowship that supported her research on the legacy of Iowa businessman Henry Field. Her passion for North Dakota is displayed in her book titled North Dakota 1960 to the New Millennium. The book provides insight into North Dakota's politics, economy, weather, and other interesting facts. In spare moments, Dr. Porter enjoys photography and gardening. In Dr. Porter's featured article on her book, she explains a quote that we can all apply to our lives. If this is where you want to be, you can make your story here. You become a person rooted in something greater than yourself. With that, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Kimberly Porter. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Shannon, and as well, uh, Clay. I guess you've kind of disappeared behind the uh, podium, so I might take a half step to the side so I'm not... Uh, actually looking at that. Welcome to the fine students of Trinity. Uh, glad to have you. And um, well, I will be giving a slightly different uh, view on uh, uh, <coughs> our uh, president, uh, but looking uh, a great deal at what his presidency and his approach to the First World War, how it came about, and I would argue that there's a difficult relationship which develops between Roosevelt uh, and uh, North Dakota or Dakota Territory. And uh, not intent to uh, dismay anyone too much, but um, I will be using the trope of a, of a growing state and a jaded lover. So uh, with that in mind, I offer you uh, World War I on the Prairie, uh, principled uh, patriotism. Ah, yes, we've all seen this picture. We've, uh, we uh, have seen it uh, many times. Uh, it appears, of course, as part of our state uh, dialogue. Uh, young Roosevelt coming to the state uh, in the aftermath of the death of his wife and his mother uh, on the same day. Uh, in the same house. And I would say that Roosevelt would prove fickle in his love for North Dakota, or Dakota Territory, uh, as the case may be. Uh, when Roosevelt was a young man, he came here, he was widowed, um, and he sought a certain solace in the state and was able to connect deeply to the state. Now, uh, Clay mentioned a few things uh, that we always think about when we think of Roosevelt and Dakota Territory. Uh, the sheriff uh, giving the speech uh, at Dickinson and the like. But he also wrote a great deal. He wrote to friends, he wrote to family, and of course, uh, he also proved uh, a rather extensive writer uh, in and of uh, the book form. And as he wrote to folks about his life in Dakota Territory, Medora, as the case uh, would be, he sang its praises uh, broadly. He sang its praises, uh, admiring its wine, excuse me, <clears throat> admiring its wildlife, uh, its beautiful vistas. He writes in Hunting Trips of a Ranchman uh, about the absolutely soul-stirring sunsets and how crossing the buttes they were just humbling. Now, occasionally he wrote other things about the area uh, <clears throat> to uh, Bammy, his sister. Uh, he made a comment uh, that he spent his days with worthy fellows, albeit ones uh, not taken to books or particularly to bathing. But still, he would famously proclaim, as uh, we've heard before, that he never could have achieved the presidency uh, of the United States if it had not been for his time in North Dakota. Now, some may argue and some have argued that this is political palaver, uh, but of course, a sturdy argument can be made 
uh, for what North Dakota provided or Dakota Territory provided him. Uh, time to salve his soul. Uh, it offers him time to reflect uh, on the role he wishes to play in society. Uh, gives him a certain manly quality that I would say might have been a bit lacking from the somewhat pre-Dakota Territory <clears throat> Theodore Roosevelt. And I think it can be argued, and someone mentioned this earlier today, uh, that um, without being here, he might not have lost enough of his fortune that he was required to get a job. Uh, and that job, of course, uh, ultimately uh, led him to the White House and, well, in some ways, led us to Dickinson on this day in September of 2014. Now, when he was uh, touring uh, Medora, North Dakota, in 18, I'm sorry, uh, 1903, Roosevelt proclaimed, it was here that the romance of my life began. And so, uh, if I may continue uh, the metaphor of an ardent lover uh, of uh, the uh, area, and just a couple more, I mean, what's not to love? Uh, come on now, it's, it's beautiful countryside. Uh, continuing the metaphor of the ardent lover, and maybe we should stay there a moment before we go to railroads. Um, his beautiful maiden, his beautiful Dakota territory, had not yet achieved statehood. As a territory, the northern half of what would become uh, the future state of North Dakota, um, well, there's only about 16,000 individuals here uh, in uh, about 1880. And the vast majority of those lived in the eastern portion uh, of our future state. And the majority of folks who lived in northern Dakota territory at this time were actually of native birth. We always think about the Scandinavian population, the German population, the German from Russia. But if you look about 1880, 1885, they did a special census just for us in 1885 that gives some nice uh, numbers that we can grapple with. If you looked at the state or the future state in 1885, kind of the central portion of Theodore Roosevelt's time here, um, the eastern third of the state has a population. The eastern third of the state has a population who are of native birth. And those individuals who are not of native birth have often been here uh, for quite some time. Once again, reflecting on last evening's uh, presentation, many of the Germans uh, who came to the area had actually uh, come to the United States as children, or they were the children of individuals who had migrated in the 1840s, 1850s. So uh, this Western land that Theodore Roosevelt uh, embraced so ardently really is not the North Dakota of World War I. Uh, at the time uh, of Roosevelt's uh, loss of his ranches uh, in the winter of 1886-87, uh, there were approximately 700,000 head of cattle uh, in this particular area, of course, moving in a bit towards uh, Montana and uh, South Dakota as well. Uh, and it would appear, if you glance at the 1885 census, which is devilishly difficult to put your hands upon, uh, that the most of the landowners or most of the ranch owners uh, were either of American birth or for Western European birth. Um, the Germans, the Russians, the Scandinavians that we contemplate as being uh, primary residents were not yet here in large numbers. By far, the vast majority of folks make their life on uh, the uh, backs of cattle, and that was made successful only by uh, the coming of the Northern Pacific Railway uh, through this area. Uh, and I would say uh, that uh, amongst other points uh, to be made, the ranching life, although not as simple and as easy as a popular book at the time, uh, money to be made millions in beef uh, by uh, General James Brisbane, I would say that it was not excruciatingly uh, difficult to make a living in the first few years. A calf could be purchased in Iowa or Texas for about $4. When it matured a year later, after grazing on public domain, never having seen the inside of a shelter, and not having any supplemental feed, well, you could sell that animal for about $20 after only a year of ownership. 
your uh, physical inputs, your financial inputs uh, were relatively small in comparison uh, to what uh, would be coming uh, down the proverbial uh, pike. So uh, it's a different world that Roosevelt inhabits in Dakota territory as opposed to what will become North Dakota. Uh, and I do have an, a bit of an example of some of the changes. Okay, we have this Medora. You'll see a different Medora tomorrow. Uh, but if you look at the railroads at the time, you'll see that with, with regard, well, you might see with regard. Okay, here we go. That the railroads that exist are really very minor in 1887. We have the Northern Pacific uh, in this range, and up here uh, we have the Great Northern, but hasn't gone all the way uh, across the territory yet. So the power of the railroads, the power of big business, as some will come to see it, really has not yet arrived. Some individuals could complain about the Northern Pacific, but yet they were making money, and that was the key concern. Well, I would then say that as we move towards the uh, 20th century, yes, my image of Roosevelt's lovely maiden, she later will become somewhat of a haggard matron before uh, we are done uh, at the uh, end, of, uh, end of my few moments here. Uh, but we see as well that by the time we get to 1892, uh, we are not only a state, as you can see, uh, but we also have additional lines uh, of rails uh, going not only completing the Northern Pacific, completing the Great Northern, but we're starting to get some spur rails that go out into some of the communities. And it's those spur rails, some by the uh, Northern Pacific, some by the Great Northern, uh, some by the Milwaukee Road, as well as, uh, as we move a bit later, the Sioux Line, that's S-O-O, -O, Sioux Line, uh, that will cut across the state diagonally, Highway 52, if you're looking uh, for that. Uh, the presence of all of these additional railroads encourages individuals to move into the state. We have the efforts of James J. Hill to bring us Scandinavian farmers who will be in the northern portion of uh, our state. Uh, folks like uh, the uh, representative uh, Alexander McKenzie, uh, the boss of North Dakota, encourages individuals to move from Germany, uh, giving us the town of Bismarck uh, in the like. So, we see a lot of population coming in what is sometimes referred to as the second Dakota boom, and we see the state filling in, and it's not just filling in with ranchers at this very western edge, ranchers who are generally well-to-do and ranchers who are generally of an American background, but it's filling in uh, with individuals who are into small grain production, individuals who by the practice of monoculture uh, are here to make a living on generally wheat production. And with this, the opening up of so many miles of rail as well as European economic conditions, we do see literally a flood of population uh, coming into uh, North Dakota uh, say 1900 to about 1910. Uh, 1900, uh, the state census, and we do have a state census, uh, marks about 319,000 individuals. Um, well, 1915, we do a special census uh, to uh, apportion the uh, North Dakota House of Rep North Dakota in the House of Representatives. That census, just 15 years later, shows 600. 40,000 individuals, more than doubling uh, the population. So we've got a lot of small towns uh, sparking up, uh, popping up, that um, I think may have been considered uh, by some to be a bit troubling. Uh, not only were individuals coming to the area, they were coming to the area reliant upon a single crop and somewhat dependent upon their old lifestyle. Uh, we uh, talked, I believe it was last evening, uh, about individuals and the presence of German newspapers or the presence of Norwegian newspapers. The Badlands Cowboy was in English. 
But many of these new folks coming to the state wanted to maintain some of their old ways. They continued to worship in Norwegian, German, uh, the German dialect uh, of the Russian uh, communities. They continued to read their newspaper as it was produced uh, in the Norwegian language, uh, in the German language. They maintained social clubs, the Sons of Norway. They were not particularly ready to meld into the larger community upon arrival. And to some ways, this gives us the dreadful hyphenates. Now, we'd always heard of the German Americans, the Irish Americans, but now we had, at least in North Dakota, large quantities of Norwegian Americans or Scandinavian Americans, uh, as well as German Americans. But we're seeing the state filling in in a way that some people would find disturbing. Now this is uh, from 1892, but you will see that the eastern two-thirds has been divided into counties, townships, and towns. But by the time we get to, let's say, 18, I'm sorry, 1900 or so, well, Adams County, far southwest, uh, in 18, I'm sorry, once again, 1900, Adams County has a total of 57 residents. By 1915, Adams County has 6,000 residents. There were towns. Now, I wouldn't say they were massive towns, but they did offer a limited supply of trade goods, a place to market uh, cattle and small grains. Henninger and Bowman sprang up in the southwest to serve uh, this need, as did Crosby uh, and Watford City uh, in the more northeast, sorry, yes, the more northwestern region of the state. Uh, over the same period, that is 1900 to 1915, what is now Divide County in the far northwestern corner of the state sprouted six new towns. It's growing, it's growing massively. Now, uh, the enterprising historian uh, wants to demand why, how, and the like. I think uh, the simple answer is wheat. Uh, the simple answer is there were problems in Europe. Take my history of North Dakota class and we'll spend a week on this. Uh, I uh, am noticing the clock, so we will spend only seconds. Wheat, monoculture. If you are making a living in North Dakota as a farmer, uh, you are practicing monoculture, and you're getting these really small towns popping up that are reliant upon the railroad. And the railroad becomes the bogeyman, if you will. The railroad uh, becomes the enemy. We have all these new lines that cross the state, but as they cross the state, they seem to manipulate the grain trade. They seem to manipulate the price of wheat. Uh, and of course, uh, they offer varying prices uh, for bushels of wheat, whether they come from farmer A or farmer B. But nonetheless, uh, in this period, 1900 to 1915, we see acres of wheat in North Dakota going from about four and a half million acres all the way up to almost 10 million acres. The price rises as well from abysmal 30 cents or so in the mid-1890s so that just before the war, uh, the European war starts, uh, individuals could claim a dollar and 25 cents a bushel. When the war is underway, that will come very, very close uh, to uh, $3 a bushel, but that will uh, be something we have to keep in mind uh, for the future uh, Herbert Hoover to deal with. Uh, but. All of these things, the sense of being controlled uh, by the railroads, by the millers, by the insurance companies, by the banks, by outsiders, give North Dakotans, and I think we could push this Montanans, South Dakotans, uh, a sense that the world could be better. They are progressives and they see that things could be better. They begin the Nonpartisan League. We see the rise of uh, Arthur Townley, who has a list of a quite progressive agenda. Now, some of these things come to fruition, some do not. Some had started before him, uh, but we see uh, such delightful things uh, as 
the initiative and the referendum and the recall coming to be. Limitations on the hours of work for industrial women. Farm wives can still work until they're weary to the bone. But we also see such things as vast increases in educational spending, vast increases uh, in uh, spending on roads, and we are a progressive state in a progressive era. So even before A.C. Townley codifies these complaints, uh, there was a sense uh, of peaceful conduct, a sense of isolation, and for the most part, relatively content in their isolation. And I'm talking more physical than political at this stage. But the war comes. And that's the good part of being this far down in the program. I don't have to tell you about the war and how it makes its appearance. The war comes. Thank you, gentlemen who have preceded me. Um, Henry Ford, automobiles. Henry Ford uh, is opposed to the war. And he uh, actually uh, charters a steamship. Oscar II, uh, to travel to what is now Oslo, Norway, uh, to attempt to set up a peace conference. This is called the Peace Ship. And Ford, someone asked last evening, well, who were the celebrities against the war? Well, Henry Ford asked individuals such as Jane Addams, Thomas Edison, Andrew Carnegie, William Jennings Bryan, John Wanamaker, among others, if they would like to take a ride. Would they like to join the peace ship? Every single one said no. He also asked a number of state governors, state leaders, congressmen. Everyone but one turned him down. The one that did not turn him down was the governor of North Dakota, uh, a man by the name of Louis B. Hanna. And uh, someone happened to mention his uncle, uh, Marcus Hanna, who was so big in uh, getting uh, William McKinley elected and a powerhouse of his own, uh, the apple didn't fall too far from the tree uh, with Louis B. Hanna. He is the only American politician to take the ride to Oslo. And some have said he was kind of stirring himself up so that maybe, just maybe, he could be elected senator to replace Porter J. McCumber. Well, I don't think that's quite true. Uh, he had his own interests uh, in uh, the war, uh, had the own interest in presenting the war, and I would say uh, that most significantly, even if he was thinking about running against Porter McCumber for the senator position from the state of North Dakota, he still went on the ride. He still took the trip. He didn't perceive that going or not going would be detrimental to his political future. North Dakotans favored peace. North Dakotans favored minding their own business, uh, so to speak. And, well, many were fearful that people from the East those money grubbers who had been involved in running the railroads, running the uh, mills, running the banks, the insurance companies, the lumber yards, the list can go on and on, were going to profit from the war, while they as simple farmers would not profit from the war, and indeed uh, they would only see their domestic costs go up. Once again, thank heavens for those who have preceded me. They can uh, go down that pathway. Hannah? Uh, as well as many of our state's newspapers in the months before the war enter the U.S. enters the war uh, reveal that the state is interested in foreign affairs. They're worried about kin that are still in Europe. They're proud to say that Scandinavian countries have not joined the war. They're very skeptical of the Belgian atrocity stories and firmly declaring that we should be neutral. They were not happy with the president's call for neutrality because he had laid restrictions on the Germans and submarine warfare, but yet had not laid restrictions on the British. Uh, many uh, of our early newspapers, and I've read dozens over the last few months, um, were clearly absolutely isolationist by Roosevelt's definition. Well, um, there's some complaints, there's frustration out there. Now, sensing that war might come and that 
Wilson might just drag us into this. Ah, here you can see the more the rail lines, the darker lines are all rail lines running in competition and perhaps taking advantage of your grandfather, uh, the farmer. Ah, so we have all of this going on, 1914, and people are worried about their economic condition. They're worried about being dragged into a war. Some of them have a knowledge of socialism. Some of them are very much attuned to progressivism. And, well, if you look at our map, uh, you can see the election of 1916, uh, and of course North Dakota is north central right in here. You can see that we vote with Wilson. We vote with a Democrat because he kept us out of war versus Hughes's very, very weak need uh, call uh, for uh, being uh, prepared. I should say Hughes's very weak call uh, for being prepared. But Many folks in North Dakota are starting to read the writing on the wall. And after they see the support for Wilson, we see Isle Grona. Now, I would like to argue that Isle Grona, as well as Henry Helgeson, are two of the bravest men in America. Two of the bravest men that you have never heard tell of. In February of 1917, uh, before the uh, United States joins the war, Henry Helgeson stood in the United States House of Representatives to sponsor legislation that would require a national referendum before the United States could declare a non-defensive war. In the Senate, Isle Grona, Republican from Lakota, sponsors the same legislation. Now, the measure failed to gain traction, and I would say that it actually would have been unconstitutional even had it gained uh, its uh, status. But still, you've got two men from North Dakota who say, no war, keep us out. No, I don't care that we voted for Wilson, keep us out. Well, you now know uh, that uh, the war is looming, but Grona, in his argument, says we w many want us to go to war for they hold the British bonds. He firmly believes that it will be economically motivated if the United States joins the war. Well, uh, of course, that does happen. We have the Zimmerman note uh, and uh, continued sinking of vessels. And our man, Woodrow Wilson, calls for a declaration of war. It is debated in the United States Senate on April 5th, 1917. The very first individual to rise and say no, the very first person to vote against the war is Isle J. Grona from North Dakota. There had to be intense pressure. Only six individuals in the Senate vote against the war. And he's the first one, by the luck of the alphabet, to stand and say no. Uh, there were uh, five others uh, scattered uh, all around the rest of the nation, uh, from Missouri, uh, Nebraska, Wisconsin, uh, and Mississippi, who all had different reasons. One day later, April 6, 1917, 50 members of the House of Representatives voted to deny the president the powers of war. Now, it can be found all throughout the United States, and those 50 individuals do represent uh, all from around the nation, but they do not actually represent our man, Helgeson. Mr. Helgeson, Representative Helgeson, was in the hospital, did not cast the ballot, and actually died three days after his colleagues had voted to support uh, the war. Now, um, we hadn't wanted to go to the war. We clearly had said this is not where we want to be. We do not want to participate. But when our nation called, North Dakota, even holding on to its progressive ideals, holding on to its, it's only the big businesses that are going to take advantage of us, holding on to its dubious reading of national papers, 
we stood up and said, I don't like it, but we're going to go. And you will notice these individuals, these young men, have answered the call uh, from Bismarck. They're getting ready uh, to depart. They're still in their civilian clothes. And you will notice that one is expressing his uh, opinions a bit forcefully to hell with the Kaiser from Bismarck. So despite being sh shadow huns, despite being hyphenates, despite being all those low, despicable things that uh, President Roosevelt called us, we went to battle. I would uh, suggest to you uh, that even though A.C. Townley tells people, don't go, make them draft money of the rich people before they draft your son. The flower of young manhood of this nation is going across the water to bleed, as we are told, for the honor of our country. But it needs some effort for me to believe that these young men are going to fight for the freedom of democracy. But they went. 140,000 men show up for their physicals. 31,000 men from North Dakota don their uniforms. And of those 31,000 men, the vast majority were volunteers, not draftees into the war. They left their mothers, they left their wives, they left their children. Some never came home. About 1,300 of North Dakotans uh, who served in the war did not uh, return to the state, about half uh, passing from disease and about half passing uh, from uh, results of warfare, killed in action, uh, died of wounds, uh, of course, many claimed by influenza at the aftermath of the war. Nurses, as well, go to the war. They are not official members of the military. They are volunteers. They are uh, Eleanor B. Roosevelt with the uh, YWCA. Uh, they are Ethel Derby, Ethel Roosevelt Derby, who was there uh, helping her husband. But women go to the war as well and women from North Dakota die in the war. I offer you Thomas J. Mealy, a young man born in Norway, volunteers for his country, dies in France. I offer you McGill Ellison, a young man who is studying to become an attorney at the University of North Dakota. He had spoken against entering the war prior to and when his country calls, McGill Ellison goes and dies in France. Uldrich Mohn, his mother is foreign born. She has been born in Norway. She tells him many times in letters which survive as typescripts, not actual letters that we have to decipher, don't go, don't go. We don't have anything to do with this war. Uldrich Moen goes to war, and Uldrich Moen could not be found. He has a cenotaph. He has a graves marker at the Marne. I think, I think we were not unpatriotic isolationists who had no belief in our nation. Rather, I think the Roosevelt picture of us from 1885-1887 was a picture of a young woman, not a picture of a matron making her own decisions. And her sons and daughters made principled decisions, patriotic decisions, with regard to their state and their nation, some of whom paid the price. Thank you so much. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, had a myriad of opportunities to express himself. Uh, the Kansas City Star, 
Outlook uh, magazine as well as uh, Metropolitan magazine. And at one time uh, he says, and I don't have the direct quote, it got cut last night, uh, but uh, the direct quote is something like, at one time I thought the NPL was okay. I had common cause, but I've come to see them differently. They are slackers. His favorite phrase was, they are shadow huns. They, every time a man joins the NPL, the Kaiser celebrates. And the time he's gathering his information, his soul is turning, is a time when we are now actually at war. It's a time when his own beloved Quentin has just uh, been killed in battle. And it's a time that North Dakota has matured in a way that he doesn't recognize. He recognized the Elkhorn Ranch. He recognized a lot of cattle and no people. He recognized people who spoke English and never heard of socialism. The North Dakota that he sees, or the NPL that he sees in uh, 1917, they're foreign born. They talk about socialism. They believe in socialism. They have a lowercase p on their progressivism. And they're afraid if they go to war, or forced to the war, that their progressivism will be hampered. It is. It is, uh, it is held back by the war. There's no doubt about it. Of course, uh, Roosevelt is not alone in becoming disenchanted with the NPL. Townley goes to jail for obstructing recruitment. The NPL begun, starts to come apart in some part because of our entry into World War I. So although Roosevelt is a very loud and angry voice, he's not by any means unique in this. No, he is not unique. Uh, I think part of the problem is indeed Townley's loud voice uh, in not wishing to have the young men of North Dakota or the young men of uh, the nation go to war until someone's wealth has been confiscated as well. And part of his problem is he has a newspaper, he can tell people, and he also has newspapers from around the state who are watching him and listening to every word he says. This speech, the portion that I read, was actually published in the Grand Forks Herald. Uh, and he actually gives his address uh, on registration day, the day that you were supposed to go register for the draft in June of 1917. He gives this address about the flower of our manhood at the recruiting station in Devil's Lake. He gives it the next day in, uh, I believe it's Minot. This uh, is Townley. Townley, yes. He gives this address about you have to uh, confiscate, you have to uh, uh, conscript the wealth of the nation before you conscript the young men of the nation. It's only fair. And so he gets a lot of attention and he stirs things up. I mean, that's one of Townley's greatest skills. He's great at stirring things up. Uh, he does not go to jail till after the war is over. He serves a grand total of 90 days. He says it's the best vacation he's had in his life. Uh, but, but, you know, and then we're going to run out of time, but I want to say the, to the, particularly to the students from Trinity High School, this is a subject really worth looking at. This is a part of North Dakota history that's so interesting. Not look at? What? No. They what? should not. They should not look at this. Why? They should not look at it until they read the book. There'll be a signing out front in... 2030. <laughs> 2030? <laughs> you should I'm look slow, at it irrespective of the publication of her book. This is one of the most interesting chapters of North Dakota. So here's what I hear you saying, and it's so interesting. That Roosevelt comes here in 1883, falls in love with this place, romanticizes it for the rest of his life, uh, sings its praises all of his life, but he's really locked himself into a particular moment and a particular ethnicity, because you were saying that the people that he loved so much were actual American-born Americans, English-derived Americans, uh, there were not some... these ethnics from Norway and Germany and so on. He had to deal with the Marquis, who of course was, was a French, mm -hmm. uh, but most of his other folks that were in the neighborhood were Scots, they were English, uh, and if they weren't Scots or English from nation, they were Scots or English by heritage, having come to the region from New England, uh, the uh, Middle West part of the nation. He 
did not recognize the North Dakota that he came back to visit. It, the state had evolved out from under his romantic conception of it. He, there are now hyphenates. There are now people growing grain and riding cars. And they're just not, they're not the manly folks he remembers. They're, they're farmers, not ranchers, for one thing. And that's what gets him in trouble in part. Uh, strong word. That's what gets him in difficulties with the NPL because farmers and ranchers are not the same people. Have different interests. Farmers and ranchers are very different. And he's taking his advice, and I have my entire direction screwed up here, but he's taking advice from his Western Badlands friends who are, think who are thinking about ranching. He's not understanding what it means to be a small grain farmer. He's not understanding the power that the millers, the um, the flour mills, the elevators, the, he's not understanding the so power. So he became disenchanted with us, but we became, dis that's the story you're telling in your book, I'm sure, with him, because when, remember when you were here last, we found that passage from the Nonpartisan League's newspaper, the leader, the week that he died. So he dies somewhat unexpectedly on the 6th of January, 1919, and that week in their statewide publication, which was huge, not just statewide, it was regional, they have an attack on Theodore Roosevelt as a jingoist, as a man who's lost his touch, and they ran 30 or so thousand copies of it, and then they pulled it from the press. It's a picture of Roosevelt's face with a phonograph horn coming out of it, and across the base of the uh, record player uh, says uh, something about Roosevelt's phony graph claims. And, uh, so they're attacking him, and then they realize, oh boy, he's dead. Yes. And they pull the they pull the the press, and then put it in an, a different article. Yeah, and they also had one earlier where it shows him chewing on a piece of granite, uh, and it says uh, the NPL is stronger than a bull moose's teeth, or something close to that. And I have both of them, but neither one of them blew up well, and and I knew the war was gone, and so I decided to spend my time on the state. But yes, it's a fascinating topic. How does North Dakota make this swing intellectually? How does it make the swing in other minds intellectually? And I will go back to my initial subtitle. It's a principle of patriotism. And in 1912, the Bull Moose campaign, he did not win the vote in North Dakota. No, he did not. He, and so that surprised him because he thought his old stomping grounds would support him. And, uh, and, and ultimately, they support uh, Robert La Follette Sr. And Robert La Follette Sr. becomes the other one of his favorite whipping boys. Here's somebody that's, uh, at one time, he suggests that uh, Robert La Follette Sr. should be shot. <laughs> he was just joking. <laughs> I mean, he, it was I'm just a, rhetorical excess. I, I assume so, but yes. still, he, he's been known to carry the big stick. <laughs> This is so fascinating. What's your book going to be called? Well, in my computer file, it's North Dakota WW1. <laughs> so North Dakota WW1, I've got room to work on You'll a You'll play with that a little bit. I'll play with that. Uh, Dr. When, Kimberly Porter. <laughs> when the poor woman sat up the, the uh, PowerPoint, she said, what's the file called? I said, PowerPoint ND WW1. I think she was looking for something clever. It was. Thank you so much. Come back and tell us more. That's a great, great subject.